Greetings friends. As most of you are aware, this planet is in transition. The direction this transition takes is up to those who now represent this planet. The elite are no longer considered the representatives of mankind from a galactic perspective. For what the elite have been trying to prevent, and quite successfully I might add, is the awakening of those they rule. Remember, they, the elite, represent less than 1% of the population. So their answer to this dilemma was to use the manifestation powers of the other 99% to achieve their preferred timeline choice. This was a short-term solution. Although their ego-based consciousness would not allow them to see or accept this truth or reality. Now that over 25% of this planet's population is in the awakening stages, they, the elite, are losing ground very, very quickly. Let me explain. The more that wake up, the fewer there are for them to rob of their focus, which includes, desires, imagination, intentions etc. This means, the natural human tendencies of the masses, are now in control. Understand. They. The elite. Have to follow the same rules. Which they set up for our different societies. When they do not. This is not willful choice. They will not be allowed to take away choice any longer. This is the real reason for the internet's existence. To even the playing field. By bringing about awareness of things that have been withheld from the masses. In an effort to suppress. So with that. I have diligently tried to find Josie. Who was working with Lark and Rose. To create these videos. In an effort to spread their message. Even though I don't completely see eye to eye with Mr. Rose. And have butted heads with him several times. I felt they did a phenomenal job providing a worthwhile perspective, which can be very helpful in the awakening process of the remaining 75%. I don't know what happened to Josie. And it seems rather strange, at least to me, that she would build such a large following, and then just disappear. It has been over a year since her last upload. Nevertheless, I have combined all three videos, for your review. Please share with everyone you can. Sometimes it can seem as if human history consists mostly of a long list of examples of man's inhumanity to man. This can make it tempting to conclude that violence, oppression and conflict are the natural state of humanity and that lasting peace is an impossible dream. But this is not the case. The truth is, Human beings, even with our imperfections, our negligence, and malice, are capable of achieving a society far better than what we have now. But to fix the problems of the world, first we must understand their root cause. Many assume that humans are just inherently bad, and think it inevitable that our greed and hatred will continue to lead to war and oppression. But before you assume that, ask yourself, are you inherently evil and violent? Are you incapable of peaceful coexistence? If all laws were repealed today, would you go around robbing and hurting other people? Absolutely not. Okay. You would no. not. Okay. No. No. You would not. Nope. Okay. Oof. Sounds tempting, but uh no. I think I would do the morally upright thing. Okay, and how about you? Uh no, I wouldn't. You would not, okay. Not a chance. Okay, so you're not the reason that we need laws. Okay. Um, I don't think so. You don't, you don't think so? And how about you? No. Oh, yes. No. <laughs> okay. All right. It's just not more. If the vast majority of individuals answer this way, just who or what is causing all the misery and conflict? And why do the good, peaceful people allow it to happen? Of course, malicious individuals can and do inflict harm on others. But war, oppression, and large-scale conflict are the result of something else, are merely symptoms of one underlying disease. Not greed, not hatred, and not simply the nature of man. If we examine large-scale oppression and violent conflict and see who is actually inflicting injustice on others and why, one common denominator shows up over and over again. 
the soldier does not, acting on his own and based on his own moral judgment, decide to go to foreign countries and inflict violence on strangers. The soldier fights and kills because he is told to, and because he does as he is told. The government enforcer who imposes the will of the ruling class upon the people does not do so because he personally decided, based on his own conscience, that such actions would be wise or moral. The police officer does what he does because he is told to, and because he does as he is told. All the tax collectors and other government busybodies who interfere in people's lives, hinder production and trade, and steal value from the people who create it, would never do such things on their own. They do what they do because they were told to, and because they do as they are told. Throughout history, the vast majority of those who have inflicted injustice and oppression on society were not acting out of personal malice or hatred. They were merely following orders. But if you told someone to rob or assault your neighbor, no one would listen to you. So how does the situation develop in which so many otherwise decent people will do the bidding of a handful of tyrants? So how do you think the famous tyrants in history managed to get millions of people to follow them? Hmm. How do you think that happened? One person, millions of people doing whatever they say. Probably uh, like money and charisma. That's probably what I would say. Okay. Yeah. Cult of personality. They use their power to oppress people to We're make back. them feel like they didn't have any power and that way they felt like they needed the king to survive. By being cruel, by killing, by using fear. people fear. Using as fear as an example. Using people's fear. 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 Having an army or something, yeah. Okay. Yep. I don't, I'm not sure actually, probably through fear. Okay. Maybe. Power. Money. Okay. Power. They had power over the people. By their, by their little minions, which enforce the power. Once he achieves power, yes, a tyrant can rule by fear, having his minions and his armies crushing any who disobey his commands. But that does not explain how the tyrant got such power in the first place. In almost all cases, when a tyrant is rising to power, the people are not gripped by fear. They are filled with excitement, happiness, and hope. Oppressive regimes grow not by promising pain and death, but by promising to take care of the people and to protect them from all the dangers of the world. Eventually, a dictator may rule by brute force and intimidation, but he cannot do that until he already has the loyalty and obedience of his enforcers and of his subjects. Government enforcers do not do what they do just because someone told them to, but because someone they view as a rightful lord and master told them to. The psychology experiments of Dr. Stanley Milgram show all too clearly that most people will do things they instinctively know to be wrong, including hurting complete strangers, if they are told to do so by someone they view as authority. Ironically, it is often people's distrust of their fellow man and the desire to have some powerful entity that can protect and defend the innocent that ends up tricking good people into condoning and funding the very institutions responsible for most of the violence and conflict in the world. Most injustice is not the result of individual malice or greed or hatred, but is the result of normal people obeying the commands of a perceived authority. Many worry about how people might behave in the absence of government, when history shows that the far bigger threat to humanity is what people do in the name of government. When asked what they want government for, people do not say division and oppression. They say they want it for good things to protect people, to care for the poor, to provide infrastructure. But instead of achieving these noble ends, politics and government over and over again end up enriching and empowering tyrants, liars, and thieves. Though many people say they want government to make things fair and equal and to protect and serve the common man, government always creates a massive power imbalance with a handful of individuals having enormous amounts of control and money and everyone else having to choose between obeying and funding the ruling class or being fined or caged. Since those in government are always vastly outnumbered by those they govern, why do the people allow this? Why would the common man imagine such a situation to be legitimate or tolerable? Why would he accept subservience to any master or feel obligated to continually surrender the fruits of his labor to an institution that views him and treats him like cattle? Politicians are masters at using fear and emotionalism to pit different groups of people against each other until the people are begging for more laws and regulations. Falling for these tactics is, quite literally, killing us. No, humanity does not need to be at war with itself. And when it is, 
It is almost always the result of political opportunists intentionally causing strife and conflict in order to enrich and empower themselves at the expense of the freedom and safety of everyone else. Those in power, often by way of the mainstream media, tell us what we should care about, what we should worry about, and what we should fear. And the proposed solution is always more government power and control. By dividing people into different camps, such as Democrat and Republican, the people can be tricked into being perpetually angry at each other, while politicians on both sides benefit. Between the ongoing vitriol and divisiveness, many people don't notice how much the politicians agree on. They all agree that they should take your money and control your life. The politicians talk as if they represent and serve their constituents, but when it comes down to it, everyone knows what happens if he refuses to pay taxes or disobeys any of the politicians' laws. Beneath the rhetoric, the situation is still one of rulers and subjects, masters and slaves. There would be no reason for free, prosperous people living in harmony with each other to want to be ruled, which is why those who crave power always emphasize, exaggerate, or create problems and conflicts to pit people against each other and scare them into believing that they need a master, that they need controllers and rulers to protect them from reality. I want every man, woman, and child to understand how close we are to chaos. I want everyone to remember why they need us. Tyranny does not come about through power-happy people confessing malicious intentions. It comes about through power-happy people feigning good intentions, thereby winning the loyalty and subservience of good people who then view the power-happy people as authority and government. In this way, freedom is whittled away piece by piece, always under the guise of serving the people, until nearly every industry and every activity is monitored, taxed, regulated, and restricted in the name of law, making the people unable to provide for themselves, unable to be independent and self-sufficient, unable to freely trade and cooperate with each other however they see fit. The primary problem with society is not that man is inherently evil, but that so many are willing to tolerate, advocate, or commit violent aggression when it is done in the name of government and law. When those committing injustice have an aura of authority, even most good people will comply and obey. When oppression is legalized, the proud law-abiding taxpayers will not only tolerate it, they will fund it, condone it, and vote for it. And while it may be easy to recognize the evils committed by tyrants and their hired guns, too many people fail to realize that tyrants only have power, only have wealth, only have influence because the people give it to them. A regime that no one viewed as legitimate, no one paid for or obeyed, would not exist. Where people do not look to an authority, do not recognize an authority, there is none. So if you want to know the source of most conflict and violence in the world, you might begin by looking in the mirror and asking yourself, which acts of aggression against your neighbors, which examples of man's inhumanity to man have you paid for, cooperated with, condoned, and voted for? For all of recorded history, some people have been trying to dominate and rule over others. On a small scale, sometimes an individual or a gang can control and extort others through outright violence. But on a larger scale, especially since technology has leveled the playing field when it comes to physical combat, being biggest and strongest is not enough. So modern tyrants gain and maintain power, not just through brute thuggery, but through deception and manipulation. Physical control has been replaced by mind control. An aspiring ruler now needs to persuade his potential subjects that it is in their own best interest that he have power, including power over them. The tyrant must convince his victims that their own subjugation is necessary, moral, and legitimate. Government, whether in the form of a dictator, a parliament, a congress, or some other arrangement, is the group of people thought to have the right to rule. In other words, thought to have authority over a certain area. What governments do is issue commands which they call laws, using force to punish any who disobey. Despite the modern rhetoric and euphemisms, government always means a ruling class. Those in power command, and everyone else either obeys or is punished. But to get people to tolerate such an arrangement, to get the common man to accept what is essentially a master-slave relationship, those who crave dominion have to find ways to get their subjects to condone their own subservience and enslavement. First and foremost, a modern tyrant must create an air of legitimacy around his regime must convince his subjects that he is a rightful and legitimate authority. 
At one time, kings insisted that God himself had directly granted them the right to rule. Today, most people scoff at such a claim, while still accepting the more modern excuses for authoritarian domination, which are a lot more involved and complicated, but no more reasonable or rational. Humanity has evolved past the superstition of the divine right of kings, but has yet to evolve past the superstition of the divine right of politicians. Tyrants today have to work harder to deceive the people into accepting the status of obedient subjects, but they still manage to do so most of the time, using a few basic methods of deception, manipulation, and propaganda. In many countries, including the United States, Soviet Russia, and Communist China, ruling classes have claimed the right to dominate the people based upon constitutions and elections. Even under the most vicious tyrannies, those in power always label their actions as legal and claim to be representing and serving the very people they extort and oppress. As much as people have been taught to revere democracy and associate it with freedom and justice, democratically elected governments have committed more murder than any other institution in the history of the world. Instead of actually empowering the people, democracy merely gives the people the false impression that they are in charge, and the false notion that, as long as they are allowed to vote, oppression and tyranny will be impossible. History shows otherwise. In reality, elections can be the tyrant's best friend, as they can be used to dupe the people into imagining that they have given their permission and consent to be dominated and controlled. At best, the people are given the choice of who will rule them, but true freedom, being ruled by no one, is never one of the choices in any political election. Even when their ballot choices are selected by the ruling class itself, allowing people to vote can deflect and diffuse their anger and resentment, tricking them into focusing their time and energy on pointless rituals which never achieve freedom, so they don't start disobeying or resisting instead. So many people now view the whole process, the constitution, the form of government, the elections, appointments, and other rituals, as not only legitimate, but sacrosanct, that to condemn the entire game and to identify it for what it is, just the latest excuse for authoritarian domination, is considered blasphemy by many, which shows just how effective the tyrant's propaganda still is at duping the people into accepting and advocating their own subjugation. But simply making a ruling class appear legitimate is not enough. For a regime to grow, each grab for power and each corresponding decrease in individual freedom must be done in the name of good intentions and noble motives. The most effective means of convincing people to give up their freedom and their money to a master is to convince them that if they don't, horrible things will happen, which is why nearly all of politics is based on fear-mongering. A tyrant does not obtain power by making the people afraid of him, but by making people afraid of each other. Even the most vicious tyrannies grew by railing against other threats and injustices, whether real or imagined, and by convincing the people that only by giving government huge amounts of money and power could imminent catastrophe be avoided. And those who seek power not only exploit and exaggerate real problems, but often terrorize the people with make-believe dangers, or intentionally cause problems themselves, just to have an excuse to increase their own power. One very old technique for doing this is known as a false flag operation, where a regime perpetrates acts of unjust violence while making it look as if they were done by some foreign enemy. Once the hatred and fear of the people has been stirred up, they almost always eagerly support the authoritarian agenda of those in power. A prime example can be seen in the recently declassified Operation Northwoods documents, which show that top officials and the U.S. military plan to stage fake terrorist attacks in Cuba and on U.S. soil and blame them on the communist regime of Fidel Castro in order to garner public support for a military invasion of Cuba. The basic tactic is not new and has been effectively used for centuries by the authoritarian empires all over the world, and it would be extremely naive to think that such tactics are not still being used today. And there are many other methods governments can use to create a problem and then use that problem as an excuse to demand more money and power for itself in the name of fighting against the very problem it created in the first place. This can be done by engineering an economic collapse, by causing poverty to justify the creation of a welfare state, by creating black markets which lead to increased crime to justify a militarization of the police force, by fueling racial or religious conflicts, and so on. Whatever those in power can do to train the people to be scared of the idea of not having a powerful government around will almost always result in the people welcoming or even demanding violations of their own rights and liberties. Of course there will always be conflict in the world, but government only exacerbates and enhances disputes and problems intentionally, because if the people are not afraid of some threat or danger, real or imagined, they would never have a reason to accept a master over them. Government power does not serve to solve problems, 
problems serve as the excuse to create never-ending government power. How many problems can you think of that government has ever fixed? Did the countless laws and billions of dollars end the drug trade? Did it end prostitution? Did it end terrorism? Did it end poverty? When has there been any government program or department which achieved its goal, solved a problem, and was therefore disbanded and repealed? It is never in government's interest to solve problems or eliminate threats, because it is always the fear caused by problems and threats which trick the people into tolerating the existence of a ruling class. Another ploy used to convince people to support tyranny is for politicians to seek votes from one group of people by promising to tax or control some other group. Those who seek power intentionally create divisions between rich and poor, black and white, men and women, different religions and cultures, and so on, telling each group that if only they elect the right candidates, their priorities and values can be enacted into law and imposed upon the rest of society. Politicians are masters at exploiting the fact that few can resist the temptation to have their views and beliefs forced onto everyone else. On every possible disagreement or difference in opinion, politicians will offer to use the force of government to legalize one viewpoint and outlaw another. Some voters will cheer for a tax to help the poor, while others will cheer for a tax to fund a police force. The politicians propose one new program or agenda after another, each requiring more money and power for the ruling class and less freedom for the people. If someone thinks that he knows how things should be, some politician will always be there promising that if he is elected, he will make that vision a reality. As long as people view law and government as a legitimate way to control others, why wouldn't each person try to use the democratic process to force his neighbors to behave in certain ways and to fund certain things? Nearly everyone falls into this trap when it is called democracy, and painted not only as moral but noble, as participating in the process and doing one's civic duty. The end result of politics is never the perfect society, or even the people getting what they want. The end result is groups of people constantly being played against each other, each side of every dispute asking government to forcibly rob and control the other side, with the only real winners being the political class. Over and over again the people have ended up enthusiastically advocating their own enslavement, simply because it is so tempting for each person to believe that the world would be what it should be if only authoritarian power was used to serve what he wants and what he believes in. As long as the battle is over whose ideas should be forced on everyone else, freedom and justice always suffer. If the other deceptions fail, the fallback argument of those who seek power is that someone has to be in charge, that there will always be someone at the top, and that the only real question is who it should be. When the people accept this lie and assume that government is just an unavoidable fact of life, they will always end up legitimizing a system of domination by petitioning and voting instead of actually trying to achieve freedom or even knowing what real freedom would look like. Democracy often devolved from being a question of what people actually want and support to an argument over which political party is less corrupt and destructive than the others. As much as people may lament negative campaigning and mudslinging, it works, precisely because those who crave power really have no positive vision to offer, so their only recourse is to paint the other politicians as being even worse. Many people view their vote not as some empowering positive thing, but as an act of self-defense and an attempt to keep the even worse crook out of power. Whoever you last voted for, did you fully trust and support them, or did you just distrust them less than the other person? Distrusted less, okay. definitely. Distrusted them less than the other yeah. person? I think I mostly trusted him, mostly. You mostly not, trusted him? Not all the way, but, um, like, by a large amount more than the other one. Distrust them less than the other person. Uh, I guess distrust more than the other one. I think I mistrusted him less than the other person. I agree. I have voted against somebody to vote for the one I awesome. voted for. Yes, okay. not voted for him, I voted against the other person. I, I guess it was more like a lesser of two evils. That's okay. sort of deal for me. Now for the difficult question. Have any of these methods of manipulation and deception worked on you? Have you accepted the idea that constitutions, elections, and other political rituals gave someone else the right to rule you? Do you view violent aggression as legitimate and righteous when it's called law enforcement? Do you feel a moral obligation to obey whatever commands those in power decide to enact as law? Do you view anyone who disobeys any of these politicians' decrees or refuses to pay tribute to them as being a criminal deserving of punishment? Have you ever willingly sacrificed and surrendered your freedom and the freedom of others 
based on some politician's promise that if you will only give him control, he will use his power to protect the people from some horrible danger? Have you ever fallen for the temptation to vote for some candidate or political party that promised to use government to force your values and opinions onto others? Or promise to coerce others into funding whatever programs and agendas you think are important? Or maybe you're just resigned to the idea that someone has to be in charge. The government is inevitable, that the political system we have may not be perfect, but is the best we can hope for. So you continue to play the game, vote for the lesser of two evils, and passively and obediently accept the outcome. For millennia, well-intentioned people have been trying to achieve peace and justice through the political process trying to vote their way to utopia, hoping that if only we had the right form of government, the right set of laws, the right checks and balances, the right people in charge, that society could be what it should be. But to one degree or another, the end result of politics has always been a ruling elite made rich and powerful at the expense of the prosperity and freedom of the people. Tyrants do not create their own power out of thin air. They trick the people into giving it to them. As long as people continue to make the same assumptions, fall for the same deceptions, keep playing the same games, and keep looking for a political solution, they will get the same results. But when people stop falling for the tricks, stop fueling oppression with their money and their obedience, then, and only then, will the cycle of tyranny and oppression end. Taxes are the price we pay for a civilized society. But if being civilized means to coexist peacefully, interacting through voluntary means instead of by violence, then taxation, one group of people forcibly depriving another of the fruits of their labor, is the exact opposite of being civilized. To steal the money that someone has earned through voluntary means is to steal that person's productivity, his time and his effort, to steal a part of his life. And to steal a part of someone's life is called slavery. Taxes are often characterized as the people simply paying for the services they receive from government but this is a gross mischaracterization. Imagine getting a bill from a private business for services you never asked for and may not even have wanted. And imagine that if you don't pay whatever price the business decides, they will wipe out your bank account, seize your assets, and possibly put you in a cage. In any context other than government, such behavior would of course be seen as immoral, unjust, and criminal. And yet we're told that when government does the same thing, it is legitimate, moral, and necessary for society. There are two sides to the immorality of taxation. First, it deprives the productive people of a large part of the wealth they produce, stealing their buying power, reducing their ability to provide for themselves and their families, and making them less able to support the things they care about. Second, it forces people to fund and support things which go against their wishes, that conflict with their own values and priorities, and that are contrary to their own interests. Government does not produce any wealth. Everything it spends, it must first take from the productive people, whether through open taxation or the hidden tax known as inflation. As a result, it is always the productive, law-abiding taxpayers who foot the bill for tyranny. It was not Mao, Stalin, or Hitler who funded or manufactured the guns, tanks, and bombs that terrorized and murdered so many millions. It was the good people of China, Russia, and Germany who felt obligated to hand over the fruits of their labor to those wearing the mantle of authority. Likewise, all the government bureaucrats, the abusive law enforcers, the corrupt politicians, their buildings, their vehicles, their computers, their utilities, their salaries, we are the ones paying for all of that. And perhaps most ironically, when it comes to the IRS and all of their tax collectors, we are the ones paying them to rob us. Everything of value in the world has come from the efforts of productive people, while the political class can only steal and destroy. In short, the good have always funded the evil, and that will continue to be the case as long as the good people imagine a moral obligation to surrender a portion of what they earned by way of taxes to those who claim the right to rule. Taxes are not the price we pay for civilized society. Taxes are how civilized society pays for its own destruction. Taxation is no different than a mafia protection racket, where a gang claims to be protecting you, while that same gang threatens to hurt you if you don't pay up. Yes, the gang may sometimes go after other thieves and aggressors, but if you don't pay their protection fees, you know that they are the ones who will be at your door next. Some argue that because taxes pay for roads, defense, protection, and helping the poor, 
Ending taxes would therefore mean no roads, no defense, no protection, and no help for the poor. In any context other than politics, such an argument would be immediately recognized as completely invalid. It would be akin to a common criminal stealing $100 from you, handing you a sandwich, and then arguing that you should thank him for having robbed you, because otherwise you would have starved. Would you like it if you could choose for yourself which government programs, if any, you were going to pay for? Yes. Yeah. Say yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll, uh, okay. okay. Yeah. I think, you know, idealistically, yes, but I don't think, again, it's a matter of things actually working. Sure. And that it, you can't pick and choose. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. If any. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. I'd like to know where my money is going. Yeah, absolutely. If they're taking my money and using it for programs, I would like to know exactly where my money's going. No, that's not how it works. Just because I don't agree with something doesn't mean it shouldn't be covered or paid for. This is how this country runs. If we don't like the process, then we have to change the process. But the way it is now, this is how it is. Politicians constantly raise tax rates and impose new taxes against the wishes of the people and constantly spend the confiscated wealth on things a lot of people don't want, such as corporate bailouts, a massive welfare state, and perpetual warmongering. If the money was only used for services people wanted to purchase and things people thought were good for society, there would be no need for an IRS, no need for those in power to back up their demands with the threat of fining or prosecuting anyone who doesn't pay up. They may pretend to be serving and representing you, but the politician's true attitude is obvious. They don't care what you want and they believe that they have more of a right to decide how your money is spent than you do. Those in power and in the mainstream media speak of taxation as the way people pay their fair share of the costs of society. The bizarre implication is that if money first passes through the hands of politicians and bureaucrats, it's good for the country and society, but if it doesn't, it's not. This implies that the people being forced to fund Ponzi schemes, government waste and corruption, and programs and agendas many people don't even approve of, somehow serves the common good, but that the people voluntarily donating, spending, or investing their own money on what they think is important is somehow selfish and destructive to society. Most of the victims of the government extortion racket have fallen for this rhetoric, and as a result, believe it's necessary, legitimate, and good for a ruling class to forcibly extort all of the productive people. If you try to avoid paying tribute to the politicians, your so-called fair share of taxes, if you try to prevent yourself from being robbed to fund things you oppose, your neighbors would likely view you as the criminal and view those who would attack you as noble law enforcers. It would be like someone getting his car stolen and instead of being angry at the thief, being angry at his neighbors who didn't get their car stolen. By portraying mass robbery as the people paying their fair share of the costs of society, thieves who have legalized their thievery can convince their victims to be proud of having been robbed and to resent anyone who wasn't robbed. This is just one more example of how politicians use the tactic of divide and conquer to keep the people at war with each other so they don't identify the real root of the problem, which is those who seek to rule over others. There is a simple question which demonstrates whether someone has fallen for this trick or not. Would you take this deal? You never have to pay any kind of tax, income tax, property tax, sales tax, etc., but you're not allowed to vote for anyone else to be taxed either. I think that makes I think that would oh. <laughs> I mean I if it if it's like in the uh like a very general sense then uh yeah, I would agree to that. Yeah. Yep. Sure would. I don't yeah. think we should be taxed. No. no. I agree. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely not. Okay. So you would not take that deal. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's okay. There is nothing greedy or immoral about wanting to decide where your money goes. Nor is there anything noble or virtuous about handing your earnings over to politicians. In fact, refusing to fund immoral and destructive agendas is righteous and justified and does serve humanity and society as a whole, even if the thieves portray such actions as criminal. In contrast, it has always been the obedient, law-abiding taxpayers who have funded every government oppression in history, and that is nothing to be proud of.